Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space This Week, the one-stop shop of all stuff space that happened this week. While starships may stay cemented to the ground, we did get to see the history-defining flight of Ingenuity on Mars, and then we got to bear witness to another Crew Dragon Falcon 9 mission to the International Space Station. Wild stuff. Remember, while we're here to subscribe, these videos, being news, are best enjoyed on their upload date, so make sure you're subscribed and belled so that you catch them on time. Anyway, let's begin the first segment of tonight's scheduled programming, all the latest news surrounding Starship. The Starship prototype at the forefront of our collective attention is, of course, serial number 15, which has been on the suborbital launch pad since the 8th of April. At the beginning of last week, all three of its Raptor engines were attached to its underside, and so hopes were high that we'd see a static fire, and possibly even a potential flight, last week. Unfortunately, no static fire, and as such no flight, has happened yet, but a potential static fire is expected to take place today, the 26th of April, as per road closure orders down at Starbase. We will then expect a second static fire to take place tomorrow, the 27th of April, this time drawing fuel from the vehicle's header tanks. If both these tests succeed, then the vehicle will be cleared for flight, which could potentially mean we may even get to see the SN15 soar before the end of the week. Failing that, it'll definitely be sometime very soon, I'm sure. And once the SN15 has made history, we won't have to wait very long at all until the next prototype rolls out. As you can see from Brendan's latest overview of Starship production, SN16 is nearing completion, with SN17 not too far behind. SN20 is still rumoured to be the first orbital class Starship prototype, and it's coming together very quickly as well. It's amazing how recent the little hops of SN5 and 6 were, and yet here we are less than a year later watching an orbital class vehicle be made. Now, you may have a couple of questions about this infographic. For starters, where are SN18 and 19? Well, it's not been officially stated, but for a few months now, it's been speculated that the two prototypes have been scrapped, similarly to how SN12 to 14 were, with SpaceX shifting focus to SN20. We'll await official word, but we may have a case similar to the presumably retired SN7.2 test tank, retired without official confirmation. The other thing you might notice from Brendan's diagram is that we now have three super heavy boosters being built. BN3, still rumoured to be the rocket that'll carry SN20 on the first orbital Starship launch, and now two BN2 variants, BN2 and BN2.1. This is due to the fact that several components have been spotted on site with the serial number BN2.1 rather than BN2. This has led us to believe that the BN2 vehicle has been split into a two-part project. One will be a test tank that won't fly, and BN2.1 will be the booster itself, expected to perform a hop test. I'm sure we'll know a bit more about these two vehicles once more components are spotted, and of course once we see them being constructed, but this is what we believe so far. So yes, overall, not as much Starship vehicle news this week, but I guess when you compare SpaceX's progress with this rocket compared to others, then it's still remarkable to consider how far we've come in such a short space of time. By the way, make sure you've liked the video if you're enjoying the coverage so far. It really helps us to survive the unrelenting YouTube algorithm and all that. Anyway, we're all wishing SN15 the best of luck with its hopeful static fire test today. And with that, we'll depart from this segment of the video and take a look at what everyone else was up to last week. I think the most exciting news last week came not from Earth, but from Mars. You guys all know what I'm talking about here. It was the history-defining flight of Ingenuity the very first powered controlled flight to take place on another planet. In fact, we actually saw two flights. The first was on the 19th of April, when it successfully completed its short proof of vehicle flight, taking off vertically, hovering, and then landing 39 seconds after liftoff. Since the Perseverance rover was very close by, we got a really cool third-person view of the flight, as well as this onboard in-flight photo of Ingenuity taking a picture of its own shadow from three meters up. The second flight was on the 22nd of April, and this was another success. 
This was a little bit more ambitious. Rather than a straight up, straight down affair, the helicopter ascended to 5 meters, hovered, then shifted slightly westward to test its ability to change direction in flight, held hover again, then shifted eastward back to where it initially started, held hover again, and then landed 52 seconds after liftoff. This flight not only demonstrated the helicopter's ability to change its direction in flight and then navigate back to the same place it took off from, but also confirmed that it can successfully counterbalance lateral wind pull. With this second flight success, a third flight was planned for yesterday, which brings me to the meta point of how at this moment I'm writing the script for this video on the day of this third flight, but so far there has been no news on if or when it'll take place. So go and check out NASA JPL on Twitter to see if the helicopter pulled it off, otherwise I'll cover it in next week's episode of Space This Week, where, with a bit of luck, we'll have news on flights 4 and 5 as well. Another game-changing moment took place on Mars last week as well, this time from the bigger brother of Ingenuity, the Perseverance rover. The rover has a piece of equipment called MOXIE, which stands for Mars Oxygen In-Situ Resource Utilization Experiment. In other words, this device is designed to produce oxygen from the Martian atmosphere that can then be used for breathing and propellant manufacturing, both of which being crucial capabilities for any realistic prospect of future manned missions. And the little guy did it! On the 21st of April, it was officially announced that MOXIE managed to make oxygen on Mars, paving the way for human exploration and propellant depots on future missions. Speaking of human spaceflight missions, we saw one of those last week. This was SpaceX's Crew-2 mission, which carried four astronauts to the International Space Station on board a Dragon capsule atop a Falcon 9. And here they all are! From left to right, we have Thomas Pesquet, a French astronaut from the ESA, Megan MacArthur of NASA, Shane Kimbrough, the other NASA astronaut, and Akihiku Hoshide from Japan Space Agency JAXA. Crew-2 was a significant flight in many ways. For starters, this flight marks the first reuse of the Dragon 2 capsule, as the capsule for this flight was the same as the one used in the Demo 2 mission. Furthermore, this was the first time a crewed flight was boosted by a reflown Falcon 9 first stage, as this booster previously flew on the Crew 1 mission. Hopefully we'll see this first stage fly again, as it managed to successfully land itself on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship about 542 kilometers downrange from the launch site. Meanwhile, in space, the Dragon capsule docked with the International Space Station on the 24th of April, and I'm sure its five crew members breathed a sigh of relief with the completion of this final stage of the flight. And yes, I did say five crew members because in addition to the four astronauts, also on board was Gwyn Gwyn, the flying penguin. So far, SpaceX have used plush toys as zero-g indicators, with a cuddly Earth, a sequin dinosaur, and a baby Yoda serving as weightless companions on previous missions, and seeing this normally flightless bird float its way around the capsule during the Dragon's voyage to the station was certainly a fun sight to see. Here's hoping we'll see a cuddly Kerbal, maybe, on a future Dragon flight. The final launch of the week took place on the 25th of April, but as is the case with the third Ingenuity flight, this is like at the same time that I'm writing and making this video, so I can't say for sure if it actually launched or not. But regardless, if the footage on screen didn't give it away, this was a Soyuz 2.1B launch from the Vostokny Cosmodrome, carrying the next batch of 36 satellites for the OneWeb Communication Satellite Constellation. If the launch did succeed, then they've now joined the other previously launched 146 satellites, bringing the OneWeb constellation a little bit closer to OneWeb's initial goal of 650 satellites, though long term they want to grow that number to over 6,000. The final launch I want to mention from last week was the suborbital sounding rocket launch of a Black Brand 9 from the White Sands Missile Range in the United States on the 19th of April. The Black Brand 9 is a two-stage sounding rocket that flies straight up to an apogee of 300 kilometers and then falls back down to Earth again, much like a firework, though of course on a much bigger scale and uh, with a bit of luck, a little bit less explosion. <laughs> on board was a spatial mapping payload on behalf of the University of Arizona. Known as SHIELDS, it's a telescope that observed the light from arriving hydrogen atoms, calculating the particles' speed and helping to further our understanding of what interstellar space is like. Here's hoping the team got the data they were looking for. Anyway, that was the last launch I wanted to cover today, which brings an end to this segment. Let's now transition to our next segment then. All the launches we expect to see over the next seven days. And there are quite a lot of them, so let's not waste any more time. Like, like how I am now. Let, why did I even say this? <laughs>
The first launch of the week is today, the 26th of April, and is a very exciting one. That's because it's a Delta IV Heavy, one of my favorite rockets to watch, not only because of how massive it is, by size it's the biggest operational rocket right now, but also because of the way it sets fire to itself upon liftoff. <laughs> the rocket will launch from the Vandenberg Space Launch Complex, carrying a classified payload on behalf of the United States National Reconnaissance Office. Given its classified nature, we don't know anything about what the payload is, beyond something something spy satellite, but we're expecting it to be launched into a high inclination orbit above the Earth. Savor this launch, guys. This is the first of the last of the Delta IV heavies. Only four more launches are left, with the last one taking place in 2023. After this, the rocket will be retired in favor of ULA's upcoming Vulcan Centaur rocket. You will be missed, you ridiculous orange giant, you. On the 27th of April, China will launch three satellites to low Earth orbit on board a Long March 6 rocket. These are all Earth observation satellites, two on behalf of the Shandong Institute of Industrial Technology and one for the Harbin Institute of Technology, a Chinese research university. On the 28th of April, we'll see SpaceX launch their latest Starlink mission, Starlink L24. This will be basically the same as SpaceX's previous Starlink launches, which I'm sure you're all familiar with by now. So to summarize, the Falcon 9 will launch 60 Starlink satellites to low Earth orbit, with the first stage touching down 633 kilometers downrange on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship, with fairing recovery expected about 80 kilometers further down using the recovery ship Sheila Bordelon. On the 29th of April, we're expecting to see Ariane Space launch their next Vega rocket. This will be their first Vega flight after the November 2020 launch failure, so hopefully this one goes well. On board will be a few small satellites, a French Earth observation satellite, a Norwegian ship tracking satellite, an American RF sensing satellite, a European Internet of Things satellite, and two American Earth observation satellites. The rocket will launch from the Guyana Space Center, which is one of the most picturesque launch sites out there, so the launch should should have a nice backdrop to go along with it. The final launch of the week will also be on the 29th of April, this time back in China with the launch of a Long March 5B. This is a very big one to watch. On board will be the Tianhe, the core module of the Chinese space station, which will provide life support and living quarters for three crew members, as well as guidance, navigation and attitude control for the space station. Space stations are pretty amazing things, and it's very exciting to witness the construction of a new one. I was a little bit too young to remember, or really be aware of, the construction of the International Space Station, so it's certainly exciting to be able to follow along with the building of China's new one. When completed, it'll be about the size of Russia's Mir Space Station, roughly one-fifth the mass of the International Space Station. That's the final expected launch of the week, which wraps up my coverage of this week's launches there. Let's now then move on to our final final segment, all the best historic spaceflight anniversaries set to take place over the next seven days. I gotta be honest, there aren't a great deal of anniversaries happening this week. Regardless, the first anniversary of note takes place on the 26th of April, when on this day in 1962, NASA's Ranger 4 spacecraft crashed onto the moon. Worry not, this was a planned collision. Ranger 4's flight plan was to transmit photographs of the lunar surface during a 10 minute window before crashing into the moon, as well as conduct an array of other experiments. Unfortunately, the only part of the mission profile that Ranger 4 actually fulfilled was the crash. An onboard computer failure prevented the solar panels and navigation systems from deploying, and as such the Ranger 4 drifted dead until crashing onto the far side of the moon without returning any scientific data. Still, at least the launch was pretty, and despite its overall mission failure, it still earned the title of becoming the first spacecraft of the United States to reach another celestial body. The only other noteworthy anniversary this week takes place on the 1st of May, when in 1930, Pluto was officially proposed as the name of a newly discovered dwarf planet, which, as I'm sure doesn't really need stating, ended up quickly catching on. Pluto is the name of the Roman god of the underworld, and the idea to name the newly discovered dwarf planet after Pluto was proposed by Venetia Burney, an 11-year-old schoolgirl from Oxford, England. Pluto was discovered at the Lowell Observatory, whose members would vote on what the name would be from a short list of three, 
Minerva, already the name of an asteroid, Cronus, generally not well liked because it was suggested by unpopular astronomer Thomas Jefferson Jackson C, and Pluto. Pluto received a unanimous vote, the name was announced, and Venetia was awarded £5 for suggesting the name, which is the equivalent of £300 or 450 US dollars in today's money. The name was soon embraced by wider culture and was apparently Walt Disney's inspiration for naming Mickey Mouse's dog Pluto. <laughs> Furthermore, in 1941, Glenn T. Seaborg named the newly created element Plutonium after Pluto, following the tradition of naming elements after newly discovered planets, previous cases being Uranium and Neptunium. And as stated earlier, the announcement of Pluto's name is actually the only other notable spaceflight anniversary this week, which brings a nice cap to this week's history segment. <laughs> And there we have it, another week is over! Not seeing SN15 fly was certainly a disappointment, but I think this was more than made up for with the successful flights of Ingenuity and Crew 2, and possibly Sawyer's as well. Not enough time between that one's launch and this video's upload, sadly, but I'll leave a pinned comment once we hear confirmation on that one. While you're down there, let me know your thoughts on whether SN15 will succeed. My hopes are high, but I'm still waiting with bated breath. Anyway, I've rambled on for long enough. On screen is a scrolling list of my Patreon supporters who helped make this show possible. Thank you all so much. And then once you've absorbed the majesty of these fantastic folk, then take a look at the cards on screen. The top is a video from me that YouTube thinks you'll like, and the bottom is my most recent upload. Statistically, this will be my SpaceX Moonship Kerbal recreation. Thank you all so much for watching. Goodbye.